Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming tonight to this public lecture organized by King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. Our guest tonight is Professor Karu Lukibi. He is the faculty member of the Tokyo University, the Graduate School for Law and Politics, University of Tokyo, and he has like research interests like from political diplo 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 diplomatic history, development of party politics, inequal trees, the history of the local society, and he has written numerous articles in unified jurisdiction and nationalism and the origin of the multi-party system and so many articles published in Japanese and Russian and English. His lecture tonight is going to be about the 105th University of the Meiji Restoration, a look into the Japanese modernization efforts in the 19th and 20th century. So we are excited to have you tonight and we're looking forward to hearing you and we have almost 45 minutes for talking then like we have the Q&A question afterwards. So if you can start, please, there. Peace be upon you all. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of King Faisal Center for Research in Islamic Study, I would like to welcome our dear guest, Professor Kauru Eokepi from the Graduate School of Law and Politics from Tokyo University. We would like to welcome the Japanese embassy members with us here today, speaking about the 150th anniversary of the Meiji Restoration, a look into Japanese modernization efforts in the 19th and 20th century. Hello, everybody. Um, Good evening, and thank you very much for being with me. I'm also very grateful for your kind introduction. Um, as introduced, uh, my name is Kaoru Yokibe, and um, I like to talk about the major restoration and the following history of my country. Now, uh, this is a, a famous uh, Japanese animation, uh, Captain Mars. And uh, this is a good manga, good man animation. And also it tells us about the characteristic feature of Japanese society. What is the resource of Japan? Unlike your country, Saudi Arabia, uh, Japan do not have a material resource so much. So our resource is only human resources. So if you look at the Captain Mars, you see that uh, there's a diversity within the team. They cooperate each other, they discuss one another, and uh, so there are a lot of empowerment and self -res uh, mutual respect within the team. And that's why uh, their team often gets the first prize. Actually, the Japan team uh, gets first prize too, too often in this animation, and it's, it's uh, it's against the reality, but I uh, hope it will be the reality around 2050. This is uh, actually a, a program promoted in Japan. And if this is successful, uh, we will certainly support Saudi Arabia to get the second prize in the world. Now, um, so to, to mobilize the human resource is therefore very important to achieve something great. It is very important to achieve a new industrialization. It is very important to invent a new technology. So if we want to live in a capitalist world, uh, empowerment of human resource is indispensable. And I think that is what Saudi Arabia is doing right now. Uh, vision of 2030 and uh, many reforms uh, within the society is now promoted under the leadership of the king's government. But in the meantime, I have to tell you that the change or reform has been the origin or uh, has been the origin or background of many troubles if you look, look at the human history. So change, in the, is, change is indispensable, reform is indispensable, but in the meantime, we have to be really careful to control the speed of the change. Otherwise, we will lose the stability of your society, of your politics. And you may have the backlash or failure of the reform. That's what we should be avoid. 
So the question is how to achieve not only changes, but uh, regulated changes. This should be the question. And uh, in my opinion, uh, Japan is, modern, Japan is, um, modern Japan is very famous for achieving a rapid westernization, but basically I think Japanese society is a conservative society. They were su successful because they knew how to regulate the pace of the change. So that's the history, that's the story I would like to tell you tonight. Now, I said that Japan do not have resource, and the only resource is human resource. But actually, Japan had second resource to survive on the globe. Japan's second resource was the longitude. Or well, to be more precise, uh, Japanese material distance from Europe, or material distance from United States. Japan was in the Far East. Japan was far away from United States, far away from Europe, therefore far away from their direct pressure unlike countries Turkey or uh, Saudi Arabia or uh, Persia, today's Iran. And so therefore Japan had more chance to prepare, more time to prepare. So if you, if you see the uh, globe and you can see how Japan was far away from the, uh, the Western uh, country, look at this, uh, this globe, uh, where is Japan? Oh my God, Japan should be some, somewhere here. So in European mind, Japan is under China. So let's look at this one. Um, where is Japan? Oh, oh my God, Japan is somewhere here. So in American mind, Japan is negligible. So maybe we should get a better map. Yeah, this one, let's see. So uh, Japan is around here. And uh, London is here. And uh, London, London is the... Uh, um, uh, zero degree uh, longitude, longitude, and and Tokyo is um, uh, 140 uh, degree uh, in east longitude. So uh, the distance between Europe and Japan is 140 degrees. Now, if you look at the United States, uh, Washington D.C. is around 80 degrees uh, to the west. Therefore, if you want to count the uh, distance between United States and Japan, I know uh, Arab people are good at mathematics, and that should be uh, 360 minus 140 minus 80, therefore the, the answer is 140. So even from Europe or even from United States, uh, Japan has a distance of 140. They have, therefore have more time and have more chance to prepare for the pressure from the Western world. This is a, a very important resource. Uh, for Japan in the modern world. So Japan has different context from Saudi Arabia. Uh, the condition is different. So uh, we have nothing to actually teach you or preach you. And we have nothing to tell you what to do, or what not to do. So I'm only giving you the uh, story of Japan. Uh, just one story, no big deal. And I hope you enjoy it. Now, uh, to think about the uh, major restoration, which took place 150 years ago, uh, we have to understand the uh, precondition, a basic condition of pre-modern Japan uh, before the uh, restoration. Uh, before the restoration, uh, Japan was under uh, shogunate government. And at the top was, of course, uh, shogun. Shogunate government reigned Japan since the uh, 13th century, uh, more than uh, six centuries, uh, more than, uh, for more than six centuries or seven centuries. At that time, Tokugawa family was the shogun, uh, like him. And under the shogun's rule, uh, there are many feudal domains, feudal laws, that divided Japan's soil and governed Japan, governed Japanese uh, territory. And the number of the daimyo uh, feudal laws are enormous. It's, it was more than 250. If you look at the United Nations today, the name, num, uh, member state was, uh, I think, 193. Uh, so less than 200. But in Japan, only in Japan, uh, you had more than 250 states. So Japan was like a universe. It was a highly divided uh, country. And under the daimyo's rule, uh, there are many uh, warriors, uh, both protecting the country, the, the each state, and also doing the administrative uh, works uh, within each feudal domains under daimyo's regime. 
and、uh, it occupied the seven percent of the whole population of population of Japan at that time. And they are the ruling class. They are the political elites. Daimyo's are like that.、Um, this is a picture in which、uh, the shogun there is making an important、uh, announcement, and all the others are daimyo's、uh, making a bow and listen to the shogun. So they are the daimyo's. And the、uh, uh, samurai was like that.、Uh, you can see that he had swords, but he is not dressed well. He isn't very rich. He looks maybe a bit tired.、Uh, many samurais were quite poor, and it,、um, but they are supposed to be the、uh, part of the ruling elite at that time. And except uh, those uh, political class.、Uh, In old capital Kyoto,、uh, there is a spiritual authority called emperor or tenno,、uh, like him. But、uh, he was respected, but he did not have a political power、uh, in pre-modern era and during the era of the shogunate regime. Now the situation changed when the American strong fleet visited Japanese coast in 1853. Uh, led by、uh, Commodore Perry, uh, very famous uh, United States naval officer, and uh, the fleet consist,、uh, consisted of uh, uh, huge steam engine ship, which Japan did not possess at that time. So Japanese people were really astonished, and had no choice but to open the country. If you look at the, this picture, it was、uh, drawn by the、uh, Japanese citizen. And this is a picture of the Perry's、uh, one of Perry's uh, ship. Uh, you can see how frightening it was. It was generated by the wheel. They have wheel on the both side of the plank of the ship, and it was generated by the steam engine. And they burn the coal to make the、uh, power, and therefore you have the smoke、uh, from the coal. And、uh, wheel was not actually that big. And the coal was not actually that black, but people were really frightened. So that's how they drove the American fleet. And they have to accept、uh, the American soldier landing on Japanese soil and open the country like that. For another example, how people are frightened. This is a picture also drawn by ja the Japanese, and this is a picture of the American soldiers. But it's like a furious monkey. And I'm sure Americans are more handsome, but that's how they are perceived. And this is a picture of the Commodore Perry, the leader of the American fleet. And it's like actually、uh, like Japanese、uh, old monster、uh, Tengu, who has a long nose and red face like that. And I'm sure Perry was more handsome.、Uh, his real、uh, photo is like this. So I'm very sorry for Perry, but that's how people are frightened. So under such a pressure, Japan had to open the country. And、uh, samurai was very unhappy about that because they thought that they can protect their country there on their own. So there arose a seclusion movement, anti-foreigners movement,、uh, soon after. And the、uh, next picture is uh, uh, the picture of、uh, one night of the、uh, British legation.、Uh, that's an old temple near Tokyo, and.、Uh, The British minister to Japan、uh, lived there, and one night,、uh, seclusion movement samurai attacked this temple. And if the the minister, British minister, was killed,、uh, it should have been a serious diplomatic accident. But、uh, he survived. This,、uh, there are three men fighting on the corridor, and in the center,、uh, well-armed Japanese samurai were attacking the legation. On the left. Well, I think the、uh, British officer, and、uh, he was.、Uh, I think he was surprised. He was astonished. He was unprepared, so he had to fight wearing、uh, his pajama. And、uh, on the right side was an,、uh, the shogunate retainer who was supposed to、uh, protect the, the British、uh, minister. He was also unprepared. He had to wear、uh, a kimono pajama, a pajama of kimono. So therefore,、uh, he had to fight unprepared. Now、uh, my question is that which side the samurai was really attacking? The British man or the Japanese man? 
And my answer is that the Japanese were fighting each other, not, not a fight between Japan and Britain. Because as I said, uh, Japan's resource at that time was a longitude, was a distance uh, from the West. So uh, yes, United States fleet was fighting, but if you look at the reality, Japan did not uh, face uh, strong uh, risk, a crisis of getting colonized. If you really look at the Perry's journey from United, to, to United States to Japan, you can see that it was really far away and the uh, American fleet was not uh, ready to fight. Uh, to keep on fighting in Japan, they have to equip a lot of ammunition, they have to equip a lot of coal, but it was very far away, so they had no idea how to supply them. So uh, according to the president's order to the Perry, uh, Perry was forbidden to fire unless he get fired. And if you look at the picture of the uh, Perry's ship again, uh, yes, they, uh, it was generated by the uh, steam engine, but you, you can see they still have mast, canvas, so that the uh, ship can move with the wind, with the power of the wind. And that's what Perry had to make use of. Uh, before getting so close to Japan, uh, Perry did not uh, fire the coal. Uh, he unfolded the canvas for, and, and used the power of the wind to get close to the Japan. And after getting close to Japan, uh, he unfolded, uh, he finished the mast and started boiling the coal and make a glorious march into the Tokyo Bay to impress Japanese people that they cannot win this, beat this fleet. That's how Perry had to fight. Actually, Perry could not fight, so Perry had to overwhelm the Japanese people and the government. So you can see that uh, Japan was under the uh, threat uh, of colonization, but the threat was not so strong. Therefore, the seclusion movement uh, gradually changed its uh, real goal. At first, it was a really anti-foreigners movement, but uh, as they did not have a real necessity to fight against the foreigners, it became a more uh, domestic political movement uh, to criticize the shogunate government and uh, make an, a domestic revolution to change the whole system. The shogun was in Edo, and the, the emperor was in Kyoto. And uh, as the emperor uh, started to support the seclusion movement, uh, he started to have um, political authority and political influence, not just spiritual authority. And uh, many discontent samurai uh, tried to overthrow the shogunate regime and make the government uh, with the emperor at the top. For example, uh, Satsuma uh, feudal domain, uh, which is Kagoshima prefecture today, um, they fight against British fleet and realize that they cannot defeat Britain and also realize that Britain is not thinking of colonizing them. Uh, they made friendship with Britain and turned their goal to overthrow the shogunate government. And another strong feudal domain, Choshu, today's Yamaguchi prefecture, uh, they fought against the fleets of four countries, United States, Britain, France, and Netherlands. That's a fearful experience. And of course they lost, but also they learned that those four powers are not thinking of colonizing Japan. So they made an army, armistice. Uh, they made friendship with those uh, four countries and turned their uh, uh, goal to, again, uh, overthrowing the shogunate government. to make a unified state. Unless you overthrow the uh, shogun, uh, you have uh, two centers of the politics, therefore your state cannot be unified, therefore you cannot sustain uh, resisting against the Western pressure. And nobody thought of uh, getting rid of the uh, emperor because that was a spiritual authority. So the only option was in the end to overthrow the shogun. And that's what uh, people uh, summarized of Satsuma and Choshu did in the 19th century. And the uh, picture I show at the beginning of my talk, uh, the shogun's important announcement, is the announcement that the shogun will be giving up running the government of the nation. 
and uh, giving the authority, political authority, back to the emperor. There, then there's a coup d'etat within the imperial court to deprive the power of the remaining power of the shogun, and uh, Choshu and Satsuma uh, took over the government. In Japan, feudal domains are called Han, so it was called Han Kuri government, uh, which was actually governed by uh, samurai from Choshu and Satsuma. And they moved the capital to Edo and changed the name, uh, sorry, uh, Tokyo, uh, today's Tokyo. And the top leader, actual top leader of the Han Kuri government was uh, the samurai uh, from Satsuma, uh, him. Uh, that's a picture I saw at the beginning. Uh, now Japanese government is suffering from a huge deficit in their financial policy. They don't have much money as, uh, more, uh, as much as they used to, so I'm using the same picture to be more efficient. So the, uh, he was a samurai from Satsuma, and he became actually the uh, top leader of uh, the Han Kuri government. That, that's the story of the major restoration in 1868. So yeah, there was a, a sense of threat from the West, uh, but we still have time, so we concentrate in the domestic reform, and that's why major restoration was achieved. And, after, and this was uh, exactly 150 years ago. And only four years later, uh, Japan dispatched a very important mission to learn from the uh, Western civilization. And that's the main member of the mission. Uh, it was called the Iwakura Mission, and uh, uh, led by Iwakura, uh, sitting at the center. You can see this is an um, interesting mixture of the East and the West. Uh, all other members are dressed in Western clothes, but the, uh, the leader of the mission, Iwakura, was still making resistance, and he still uh, wore uh, traditional kimono. But if you really have a good eyes and look at his uh, feet, uh, he already uh, showed uh, Western shoes, so it's a strange mixture of different civilization. And as he, he keep on traveling, he gave up resisting and uh, turned into Western clothes. And the, uh, actually, the most important member was uh, this guy. Uh, and actually, he was uh, uh, this uh, young samurai I've just shown. His name is... Uh, and he started to dress in a Western style, and uh, he started to um, grow a mustache. I think that's a German style, but I like your mustache better, actually. And uh, his name is Okoto Shinichi. If you want to uh, remember an important, important figure of uh, modern Japan, uh, Okoto Shinichi is the right, right person. He was a poor samurai in the uh, southern part of Japan, but he led the major restoration. And later, he led the Meiji government as a whole. And uh, I had, I had, today I had learned from your director uh, that uh, your government uh, many years ago dispatched a huge program uh, to let the young generation travel around the world and learn from uh, foreign universities. And it, it, it is a great support and assistance of your recent reform, right? And uh, Japan did something similar, but they did more drastically. Uh, they, are, they are actually the top leaders of the government. And without them, the Jap Japanese government will stop functioning. And they decided to dispatch all of them to move around the world and learn what is going on in the Western civilization. So their journey was very important. And uh, their journey was very important. And the fact that they started from the United States was also important. Let me talk about the journey. They at first landed on San Francisco, and it was also important, because in San Francisco, they for the first time learned what the uh, Western city are like, what the Western civilization are like. Then after looking around the city, they got on the train to travel to the east, to Washington DC via Chicago. And suddenly, they found no population from the train. So uh, they, in their report, they tried to um, publish many uh, interesting pictures, attractive photos, but uh, they are very uh, embarrassed. After San Francisco for a while, all they could show is a map of the uh, train, which is very boring. But this is very important. As they keep on tra traveling, you have a settlement of Indians. They decided that Japan will not follow their course. course. 
And as they follow, they keep on running, they started to look at them small villages, then small towns, then small cities, and eventually Chicago. So they have the idea of Western civilization in San Francisco, and suddenly it gets extinct, and it gradually grow up until they reach the next mega city, Chicago. And they understood, they understood that their horizontal travel by train is actually vertical travel to civilize, to learn the Western civilization. So they had, they felt somehow sure, you know, there's a big gap, technological gap, industrial gap between Japan and Western civilization, but there's a ladder you can follow up. So if you continue to make progress, continue to make efforts, somehow, someday, you can reach, you can get what you want. That's what they started to feel sure during this long journey of train. And when they reached Europe later in the journey, that was an era of world exhibition. In 1851, they had the first world exhibition in London. And in 1855, the second exhibition in the Paris. Uh, this is a picture of the second exhibition. And what they saw in the world exhibition is the world of capitalism. And they, there they learned how capitalism works. Capitalism is a kind of universal discipline that forces everybody to work in the same way, to behave in the same way, if you look at superficially. But if you really look at capitalism, you have to be different. You know, each country should be different. Each com company should be different. Each worker should be different. Otherwise, you cannot sell your strength. You cannot appeal your own characteristics. So if you really understand what capitalism is, you have a chance to appeal your own characteristic. You have a chance to find your own tradition. And you have, to, you, can, you have a chance to make it your strength to appeal it to the world. In the, in the pavilions of the uh, world uh, exhibition, each country like France or Belgium or Germany, they all present in a different product, telling everybody that we are the best. And they compete with each other. And to compete with each other, they should be different. That's how capitalism would work. And in uh, 1867 Paris World Exhibition, it was the first time Japan participated in. And uh, Japan, of course, tried to show that Japan is different. That's a Japan circus. Uh, they presented uh, for the third uh, world exhibition. And they believe, they hope that this is uh, unique for Japan. And that's how capitalism works. Now, uh, in a few minutes, uh, we are moving to the, not in a few minutes, but uh, uh, soon, uh, we are moving to the floor discussion. But don't, don't ask me to do, do the same. Uh, Japan has, Japanese people have changed the routine. No, we cannot do that. But that, that's how Japan invented. Uh, its own characteristics. Um, someone tell me how to get rid of this? Maybe uh, this personal computer doesn't like Japanese circus, so maybe I need technician. So uh, in the world of capitalism, uh, we cannot simply modernize. Uh, we need an intercourse between tradition and modernization. And that's what uh, Japan top leader uh, realized uh, during their journey of Iwakura mission. So let's move on to the slide, hoping that this will disappear. No. Well, um, I'm not uh, giving you details of history. Y you only need to look at the, the uh, figures of the uh, year Japan made reform. And you can see that Japan kept a rather slow pace or uh, stable pace to uh, promote the reform. Thank you very much. For example, in 1873, uh, Okoto Shimichi's government declared that uh, they will concentrate on economy, not expansion to the continent. And in 1881, uh, the emperor gave people a rescript to promise to establish a diet, but not, not now, uh, nine years later. And in 1889, uh, the emperor uh, promulgated the constitution, Meiji constitution. And according to the constitution, uh, the next year, the diet was established in accordance with the promise made in 1881. And in 1898, uh, there's an experiment of party cabinet only for four months, a very short time experiment. 
And in 1906, uh, party cabinet started intermittently, so with intervals. Party cabinet and cabinet based on army, and party cabinet and, and cabinet based on the army, like that. And in 1924, uh, male universal suffrage was introduced, and from that year, a party cabinet system started regularly, uh, change of government between one party and the other. So the modern world is very quick to move, but you can see that the Japanese government had a kind of wisdom to regulate the pace of change. And during that change, uh, the, the, the system, uh, the, the imperial system, where the authority of the emperor of, of Japan were well preserved and respected by the people, worshipped by the people. So Japan succeeded not in making a rapid uh, westernization. Yes, there was a kind of boom of Western civilization at the early stage of Meiji era, uh, at the beginning of the 1870s maybe. But after that, uh, the Japanese government uh, changed their mind and to regulate the pace of change in which they are successful. And that's the history of modern Japan. But it is not an easy task. I also had a discussion with the director a few minutes ago saying that um, uh, Japan and Saudi Arabia uh, both should think of the uh, change, uh, no, pace of the change, not, not just a, a drastic change. But, uh, and uh, Iwakaru Mission to, uh, made a very important contribution to make uh, Japanese leaders convinced of that way of thinking. But also there's a risk. You climb up the ladder of modernization, and you can take time. But at the end of the day, at the end of any day, you stop, you stop at a certain point of the ladder. And you have to explain to people why you have to stop there. Why you cannot move on, next step. And the next day, at the end, on the end of the day, you have to make the same explanation. So there's a kind of risk of the obsession, obsession of accountability. You know. Not many people ask you to make a drastic change, but anytime you stop, you have to explain. You are asked to make an explanation. It's a kind of obsession of accountability. So I think Japanese uh, modernization was successful. They kept and regulated change. But in many instances, uh, many people outside the government and also inside the government complain that the change is too slow. So you have to control the pace of the change, and you have to control this obsession. And once you fail to control the obsession, what happened in Japan is that um, you have an obsession to make further progress, and you have a uh, reaction, uh, reactive counter-obsession to uh, slow down the, uh, the, the progress, which took the shape of the rise of militarism in 1930s and the collapse of party cabinet system. And as you know, in 1937, Japan went into sino japanese war under this militarism, and in 1941, uh, went into desperate war with the United States, uh, which was followed by the defeat and surrender in 1945. So to regulate the speed of change is very difficult. And Japan was successful until a certain time, until 1930s. So how Japan regulated the speed of change? What kind of wisdom you can draw from that? Well, try not to be too quick and try not to give too much expectation to the people. Make a progress, but just a little faster than the average people. And if you don't give too much expectation, the average people are normal, normally uh, conservative or rational, and they don't ask for uh, too quick progress. And so fulfill that uh, moderate expectation, or a, a bit for, a, a, just a bit more. This is uh, one of the bureaucrats of the Meiji government. He's not uh, famous at all. You don't need to remember his name. Well, his name is Inoue Kowase, but you don't force you to uh, remember his name. But actually, in the backyard, he was very important. He was the actual uh, founder, a writer of the Meiji constitution. And uh, he did not believe in democracy. He did not believe in the people. He was a very pessimistic conservative. But because of that, he made a great uh, contribution to the Japanese history. He wrote the constitution, and he argued against the top leaders. 
top leaders were more cautious and uh, argued against giving too much power to the diet, too much power to the people. But in a way, Kowashi argued that we have to give them a bit more. You know, if the constitution dissatisfied the average people, then the average people may start complaining. Then maybe you have to uh, reform the constitution, rewrite, rewrite, the, rewrite the constitution. And it might be the opportunity of political disputes. So satisfy the average people, or satisfy a bit more than the average people. Then people will not uh, complain against the constitution. Then you can keep on the same constitution, and things will be stabilized. And actually, they could keep on with this constitution until the, the defeat of the war with the United States. So the constitution was uh, only reformed in uh, 1946. So this con constitution um, was in operation for more than a half decade. And uh, that's how Inoue Kowashi worked. He worked really hard. And he worked too hard, so he died early. And when he died, his doctor visited his house. And the doctor was astonished. There was no drop of blood inside his body. And so the doctor reported that he used the last drop of the body for the Meiji state. This is physically it is impossible, but that's how the doctor reported, and that's how people believed. So he worked really hard, and he made a great contribution. Because of his conservatism, he's not very popular today, but uh, I think uh, the wisdom of that kind is important to start the change. And with that kind of wisdom, you can feel sure, you can feel safe to start the change. Now, uh, if I have two minutes left, great. Um, I can show you the result of the Japanese modernization. And one of them is the uh, Japanese victory uh, in the war against Russia. Russia was at that time the strongest country in military, in army. But uh, Japan won. At least uh, Japan could uh, seize the war uh, while Japan was in the advantageous uh, position. And I, I don't have time to give you the details, so I only show you three pictures of this war. The picture at the top, you can imagine this is a battlefield of the Japanese war. You can see that this is a harsh battle. And the Japanese people or Japanese newspaper are really keen on that. But actually, no less than that, uh, what Japanese newspaper are keen on, and Japanese people are looking at, is the domestic society of Russia. How Russian children are, are treated, how poor they are, how Russian women are thinking about the war, how they are complaining, how Japanese wor uh, Russian workers are thinking about the war, and how much burden they are under, how many chances they have for the Russian revolution inside Russia, which means that Japanese people knew that this is a severe war, this is a very difficult war, and the, the only chance is that the Russian society, domestic society, gets unstabilized and, and therefore uh, feel reluctant to continue the war. And they are looking at that. At that. And finally, uh, there's an, the first uh, Russian revolution, which took place uh, in 1905, and that's why Russian emperor agreed to stop the war. And in the meantime, what happened in the uh, Japanese society? Well, Japanese society was also uh, unstable, unstable. The war was uh, very severe. And so we had a kind of rebellion campaign in Tokyo. But what people in Japan said that we want to continue the war, and we want to get a better condition of the armistice. While the Russian Revolution, uh, people asked for uh, stopping the war. So that's how constitutionalism and parliamentary uh, tari politics works worked in Japanese society. There are many problems, of course. There are many complaints. There are many complaints in the House of Representatives, in the Diet. But uh, because they could complain in the parliament, uh, they f could feel that they are a member of the nation. And once there's a war, they should stop internal disputes, and they should fight for the nation. And that's the difference between Japan and Russia, and that's how Japan survived the war. Now, the final uh, slide is this. Uh, how Japan uh, achieved high economic growth. And also uh, the way Japan regulated the change I is important. Now, if you are interested in the high economic growth, um, I have to tell you that the explanation or the background of high economic growth is recently changing. It has a tendency of simplification in academia. Because if you look at the 1960s, 
the society that achieved the high economic growth is only Europe, Western Europe, United States, and Japan. So we try to make a kind of complicated picture, how Japan was unique, how Western Europe was unique, how America was unique, how they dare to succeed in that. Japanese nationality, people's mind, or a certain policy of the uh, Japanese ministry, something like that. But after that, uh, in oil boom, Saudi Arabia made a progress, and uh, um, also other European countries start to make a progress. And of course, APEC, Korea, or China joined a huge movement of high economic growth. So with a certain condition fulfilled, high economic growth can take place anywhere. So we have to have a simple explanation. So recently, we count only three conditions, three conditions for high economic growth. And one is uh, capital and te technology from abroad. And it was achieved thanks to the United States in Japan's case, uh, because it was Cold War and uh, United States wanted a strong ally in East Asia and that was Japan. So United States gave um, warm support for Japanese reconstruction. And the second con con uh, condition was entrepreneurship. It's a uh, mind of company, mind of presence of company, making uh, 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 aggressive investment and uh, aggressive introduction of capital and technology. And uh, for this condition uh, in Japan, uh, politics was very important. One for, uh, the, uh, in 1960, uh, Japanese Prime Minister announced an income doubling program uh, promising people to double their income in 10 years. And it changed the social atmosphere completely. A year before, Japan was in uh, political disputes. Uh, this is an uh, angry crowd surrounding the Japanese diet because the prime minister at that time tried to change the constitution and make it somehow uh, going back to the pre-war regime. Well, not exactly pre-war regime. Uh, the prime minister accepted the Japanese constitution, but they tried to change the the new constitution and make uh, more shift back to the polio society or pre-war mentality. And the people were angry about that, so make a huge demonstration. And the uh, uh, prime minister had to step back and new prime minister uh, announced the income doubling program. So it, it completely changed the social atmosphere. It helped the uh, engineers, it helped the president of the company, it helped the workers that they can concentrate in the economic issue, not the political issue. And the government will support that and understand that. So therefore, the second condition was fulfilled in Japan. And the third condition was the surplus of labor in rural areas. If you have surplus of labor in rural area, uh, you have uh, cheap labor uh, to run the industry. Uh, if you have cheap labor from uh, abroad, uh, it uh, serves the same purpose. But in case of Japan, uh, Japan, uh, preserve the kind of homogeneous society, and therefore cheap labor in rural areas are very important. So uh, many uh, children who have just graduated from uh, junior high school were uh, persuaded to move to uh, big cities like Tokyo, Osaka, or Nagoya. Uh, that's a picture of the, those children uh, called golden eggs, which means actually the cheap labor. And in the, this is a platform. Uh, they just got out of the uh, train and uh, and the company, uh, company uh, members are uh, welcoming them. But after that, they have to work and severe, tolerate and uh, severe labor with cheap uh, wages. But that's how uh, Japan get the cheap labor and boom up the, uh, their industry. And uh, uh, that condition uh, ended in the middle of the 60s. So in the middle of the 60s, Japanese high economic growth should be uh, end. Uh, but actually, Japan could continue for uh, further uh, five years, which made the Japanese economy really great, uh, bigger than the uh, Western Germany, therefore became the uh, second largest economy in the world. And in 1980, it became the uh, first largest economy in the world, uh, exceeded the United States, uh, although it was just for a while. And the reason was that those golden eggs made their own families in the big cities. And they did not usually invite their parents living in rural areas. Therefore, there was a rapid increase of nucleus family, a small family. A uh, small family consists of just one man or one woman, or just one couple, or just 
uh, one set of parents and their children, the small family. So we had a rapid increase in number of the families, and each number wanted to buy a new uh, household appliance, electricity, like TV, washing machine, and refrigerator. And that gave the huge demand for the Japanese industry. Therefore, Japanese industry could keep on growing for five years. So there, in, in, under those conditions, high economic growth was achieved uh, in Japan from 1950s and uh, in the middle of 1950s until the end of uh, 1960s. And uh, back, as a background, politics was also important. And uh, enlightened prime minister um, gave out the plan to reform the constitution and uh, to the backward and uh, announced the income doubling program. So uh, in conclusion, um, I can say that change is necessary on the global capitalism, but also pace of change can be controlled. And this is the most important part of the government, of the politics, and of the history. And the wisdom of Japan to control the uh, pace was uh, not to be told too quick, just a little faster than the average people's mind. I have uh, little knowledge about your country, Saudi Arabia, so I have no idea whether this should serve your purpose, this should be your reference. This is just a short story of the Japanese history, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much.